All right, guys, so welcome to introduction to testing in Python. So let me just introduce myself. I am Aniruddho Odhikari, but most of the people in my own home country can't pronounce my name correctly. So you, I won't mind if you just call me A-N-I Ani. That's, everyone calls me Ani back there. So yeah, so I'm a software engineer at Telenor Health. So we're like a startup and we are working on providing healthcare to like the remote parts of Bangladesh because Bangladesh like doesn't have adequate healthcare services. We're trying to push healthcare through like mobile phones. Uh, we're trying to push digital health insurances to like everywhere we can. So yeah, that's Telenor Health and that's me. And I've been programming in Python since 2009. So it's been like 10 years now. And I must say, I love it. And yeah, so let's move on. So since you've come to this workshop, uh, that means like you want, you're interested in testing. Uh, maybe you want to know how to test. Maybe you want to find justification for testing. Why should I test my code? I mean, my work code runs. That's why I pushed it to master, right? If the code didn't work, I wouldn't push it. So let's just go through a few things. All right. Did you ever make this comet message ever? I don't know. Git comet, it works on my machine. It works. What happens then when you push it to your build server? Oh, it suddenly stops working. But it works on my machine when the operations team asks. You know, it works on my machine. So here's the thing, right? Often we need to test not for the business, like not for fulfilling the checklist that it has to like enable a merge. It's more for like ourselves. You see, when we don't test, do you, did you ever work on like really old or large projects that doesn't have test code and everything you change, like suddenly you change like here, you like put up the mouse and the light turns off? <laughs> like, what? It happens. It happens when you have no tests. Then you have no way to say the whole system is working. The only way to say if the whole system is working, yeah, run all the test cases manually by like a someone. Go through each and every business case. Yeah, and everyone does, every business does that, right? Everyone? Yeah. No, no one does that. No one does that. <laughs> so then again, as we were saying, so we need to test again for confidence. So if you're like always scared, like, hey, if I lift the mouse, will the lights turn off? You can't code. The thing that would take you like three minutes will end up taking three days because you will, don't, you will not have confidence in yourself or in your code. So it's really important that we like have some tests to give us the confidence we need. So by the time, hopefully, everyone has uh, cloned this repository. It's written on the board. It's goo.gl, it's Google's URL shortening service, slash small k, capital N, capital N, T, capital Y, capital X. So if you go there, you'll find a GitHub repository, and you'll need to like clone it to your computer to like move on with the whole workshop. So the workshop is designed so that you can go at your own pace you don't necessarily have to move at the pace of your peers or anyone. You can go on your own pace. The instructions are there. And if anything's unclear, I'll come to you and show you what's wrong or what's right. So we might be thinking, uh, we never test code, right? I don't know how to test. But that's wrong. You have. Ever since the day you wrote your first Hello World, you tested the code to see if it prints Hello World. You printed it, you wrote this in an interpreter, checked whether the correct output was there. That's manual testing. You've been testing since day one. You've been testing since the day you wrote your Hello World program. So anyone does Django here? Django? I, I yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, so what happens? We go to an error, we find an error, then we find what's wrong. We read the error message and then we fix according to the error message, right? That's what we do, right? So yeah, then we refresh. 
Hit refresh on the browser. Yeah, it suddenly starts working, doesn't it? So we need to go and see the error messages to find out what's wrong and manually test our code. We've been doing this, folks. This is not new. OK, we've been doing this for a while. This is not new. So since we've been doing this for a while, why not automate it? You see, the whole purpose that we're programmers or developers, we're trying to automate something, or at least being speed to something. When we're building like a train ticketing system, we're taking the ticketing agents out and making sure that no one has to leave home you know, to book a ticket. That's the purpose. We want to make things faster. We want to make things more efficient. And that's why, as developers, it's essential that we remember this and like automate things. I mean, that's the whole purpose. That's why we were hired. Okay, let's first start with something called naive testing. So this is no formal term. This is like the term I invented while I was coming to Changi Airport. So what this involves is basically You'll find out if you do this. You need to check out to step one. Most of you have probably done with step one. So if you go there, you'll find out what it is. I'm not going to explain. I'm just quickly going to go through the steps. And then you can like move on at your own pace. So you first start up with step one. You find out what it does. In step two, we write test functions. So test functions are functions that's dedicated to testing your code. They do not have business logic in them. They do not have something a program executes. They execute only when you run the tests. That's in step two. What's in step three? We find a better way to run tests. We use a test runner. We use a utility that looks for your pro in the whole program, in the whole source code for tests. It collects the tests. It then runs one by one, then gives you a test report. That's covered in step three. And in step four, we go through a practical use case where without writing tests, we cannot do much. So we go through a practical use case. So here, we're not building a calculator test. We're building a credit card validator. So it's going to be a bit more challenging than adding two numbers. So in step five, we will see how to write test case classes. So once you start writing tests, you'll see that grouping tests together and having classes becomes very much important to like, you know, have sanity in your code base or in the test reports. We're going to see that, how that works. And in step five, we will learn one of the best practices of writing tests is that parameterizing your tests. Sometimes your test functions may look, look like too close to each other. And then you can like use one function to test a many functionality. So we'll check that out. And in next, we will check what's mocking. So sometimes you hear the words like mock and stub and things like that, mock your environment. We're just going to go through what they are in, step, in the next step. So let me just give an idea of what mocks are. Basically, when you have your application, it has certain functionality. And it needs, it has a dependency on something that's beyond your control. This is your control zone. The, you control everything in your application. But something in a third party package, something on the disk, something on a network connection, you don't have control over it. The electricity might run out. The network connection might get disrupted. The disk might stop spinning. So this is beyond your control. You cannot guarantee this. So for example, if you had a, something of a function that made an HTTP call, but you didn't have Wi-Fi connection, the test would fail. So this is not a good thing to happen. So what we do, we kick this out. We bring in something called a mock, which is in your control. We use the mock to mimic the functionality of what it could have happened when the connections are all right. We never make an HTTP call. We never write to disk. We just mock the functionality. So in the final step, in the last steps are actually, we will learn how to refactor your code for testing. You will find another code file that's like all spaghetti code. 
the kind of code we all like. One function, 900 lines. Yeah, lovely. You know? Everyone loves a function with 900 lines. That's so easy to test, especially when it reads and writes from the STDIO. It's just amazing, right? So we will see how we can refactor that into something testable and something manageable. And finally, this is the last topic of the day, which is measuring test coverage with coverage pi. So a dis disclaimer, right? Sometimes I'm not saying that managers are bad or managers don't understand coding. I'm not trying to assume that. I'm assuming they know. But the thing is, often um, everyone wants numbers, right? So how do you come up with numbers? So one way is we developers thought of like, hey, this might be a good way to come up with like numbers, you know, percentages, is the coverage. Like, what's coverage? How many lines ran during a test? You can cheat coverage very easily. So, but I suggest you not to. I'm gonna show how you can effectively use coverage to like um, actually get some sort of a reflection on what part of the code are being tested. And I'll show you a few things where coverage fails magnificently. Um, I don't know, it's just weird. So this is what coverage does. It shows you these lines didn't run and marks them in red. And the lines that did run during a test, they mark in green. Yeah, so yeah, that's the whole story for today. So what happens now is you clone the repo, you go into step one, you try to follow the instructions. So let me just do that right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Pardon me for the, uh, okay. All right, so here we are. So for this exercise, uh, I would recommend that you use a coding text editor. Since all of you are here, that means you know how to use a text editor or an IDE. I'm assuming that. So, yep. All right, so let's just go to step one. I'm just showing this from the uh, browser. I'm gonna go into it much later. So at first, you'll see the table of contents, like which step does what thing, and the name of the branch. And if you were a very good programmer who listens to the problem, to listen to the customer, you'd have noticed that something's wrong over here. All right? If you didn't, you need to work on your attention skills. All right, so let's just talk about the business logic of like how we verify credit card numbers or how we understand who issued a certain credit card. So there's something called an IIN or an issuer identification number and each of the credit card issuers have their IIN. I just showed you the small version. Let me just show you the big print. Okay, this is, yep, you have a pretty nice table at Wikipedia. So we're just working with the three most popular vendors, I think, American Express, MasterCard, and Visa. So what does IIN mean? So if, an, if a card number starts with 34 or 37, it is an American Express card. If it starts with a number between 51 and 55, it's a MasterCard. If a card starts with four, that's Visa, right? Simple enough business logic to get started with. So here's how you run the tests. You run Python card validator slash issuers.py, and I, there are a few tasks that you need to do in this step. So let's just do it. Let's do it together, all right. I'm bringing in my IDE. So I love using PyCharm from JetBrains. It's an excellent IDE. I'm using the community edition, so you can, you can have it for free. So that's not, a, not an issue of costing. I'm just gonna increase the font size so that you guys can see what I'm doing. All right, so 15, 16, yeah. Can you guys read on what's on the screen? Is it okay? All right. So, let me just uh, 
Mm -hmm. Get into mirror mode because it's just getting difficult to stare at the screen. So I'm just going to go change my display settings. Uh huh. There we go. Nice and cool. Awesome. So let's just read the instructions. In the README, so we said we need to fix the get issuer function uh, to fix a bug. What bug is it? I don't know. And add a test case for testing American Express card. So let's just see. Let's just first run the test. So he says that I need to run this command to run the test. So OK, I'm running this. Oh, OK. I'm getting an assertion error here. So something's definitely not right. Let's just go there. I mean, the card number, look, it's 4862. It starts with 4. It, it, it should be a Visa card. But for some reason, it's, not, it's saying it's not a Visa card. All right, let's go to issuers.py. So here's how we did, did it, right? At first, we have the doc string of the module. That's fine. Then you have the function. Here's the funny thing, right? Instead of having separate test functions or anything, we're just, we just have a block with if name equals main. So if the file is directly uh, executed, then we run the tests, some sort of tests. So, yeah. All right. So, let's go there. Can you spot the bug here? Well, what's wrong here? I mean, why isn't like the Visa card is being marked as a Visa card? Anyone care to tell me? Because I'm just lost. This? What about this? Do we like? It's okay, right? The syntax looks okay. Let's let's have a look at the business case. Um, here is it. There you go. That's the business case. So American Express looks good. Like three, four, seven it looks good. Oh, did we just mix and match like Visa and Mastercard, right there? So we just need to swap these, right? Let's swap these. Let's see what happens. Let's do this. Let's do Visa. Let's do MasterCard. All right, let's run the tests. Okay, there's still an error. All right, that's, let's just go to the test code. So it stopped at line number 39, so which is this. Of course it will. It's assert false. Why? I mean, come on. So these two tests pass. So the instruction is replace the following assertion with a test for American Express cards. So let's do that. Um, assert, get issuer. So three, five, uh, six, that's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All right, it's okay. All right, let's do this. Well, what? Unknown card type? Looks like we got a exception. But it does start with three, right? I mean, that's a problem. Anyone care to tell me what's wrong here? See, it starts with three, right? My one starts with three, too. Hmm. OK, three, five, six, five, six. It should be a valid card. I'm not sure what's wrong here. The second digit? Oh, yeah, it should be four and seven. Yeah, I see. I see what you mean. You're right. All right. So let's do it. Three, seven. OK, should it work? Oh, yeah, all tests passed. So Visa test passed, MasterCard test passed, all tests passed. So. What did we do? We did two things. We fixed the logic in our main code, and we fixed a test. Not fixed, essentially. We just wrote a test. So yeah, it's working. We have the tests. So that's great. But here's the thing, right? How many of you would like to run your test like this, like if name equals main? 
and having the test code in the same place as your like main code. And what if like it was like a CLI and it would need to run in main? Then what? Every time tests run, when you try to execute a program, then the program will take like three minutes to load. Who does that? No one. So, what's a better way? To find a better way, let's do something first. Let's just comment this in, just in case we can go home and see how we solved it. So git add everything. I wrote a good git ignore, so you don't need to consider like the caches and like other things getting in. So git comment m. Uh, I fixed the bugs or something. Anything you prefer? Guys, I think you can see the terminal. Uh, can you see the terminal text? Or should I like increase the font size? You can? OK. All right. The terminal isn't like that like important here. OK, so we did step one. Now let's go to step two. So how do you go to step two? We check out. Git check out to step two. All right. OK, now let's go to the readme file. I think I'll just use the browser here. It's much easier to read with the browser. Yeah, there we go. OK. We did step one. We have nine more steps to, eight more steps to go. So, OK. Looks like running tests is an, a bit more classier this time. I wonder what's changed. So, make a function out of the statements in, oh, there's a new file, tests, test issuers and make three separate test functions for testing Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. Um, all right. OK, first let's see if there's a new file according to this. Oh, yeah. Look, we have a new package called tests. And it's outside the bounds of the initial package we were working with. So under the tests package, we have something called test underscore issuers. So why is there a test underscore before it? I mean, it could have just been issuers.py. There's a reason for that, and we're going to see that in the next <coughs> step. But till that, let's just wait and just go on with the flow, right? Let's run the tests first. Let's just copy this in and run the tests. Hey, didn't it get copied? Copy? Yeah. All right. So all tests passed. Let's just see what the file looks like. All right. So what we did is essentially we made a new file called test underscore pi, took all the test code out and just put them in. We imported the get issuer function from the card validator. That's it. That's the change. So we have two tasks here. Make this a function. So can you guys make this a function? I think we can. Like, just make this a function. Let's do this. Um, task one. It's def uh, test card recognition, I guess. A test get issuer. I think that's better. Get issuer. Yeah. All right. Let's now run this. Yeah. Whoa. What happened? Oh. Expecting an indented block. Well, of course, I'm not in JavaScript, right? So I need to. There we go. Oh, what happened? Oh, there we go. And that should make things better. Well, nothing's running now. Um, that's a bummer. Now, how to run this? I mean, this isn't running. The tests are not running at all. Maybe I just do something like this, right? If name equals main, I guess. Uh, we run this, right? Yeah? That looks good. All right. Yeah. Task one done. We made our test function, and it's outside. Well, now, the task two tells us to break down the test into Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. Now, we're going to see how like, an ID like this can help you to do things like this. So we could just you know, make a function. So let's do the, do the first, the obvious way. 
we cut this bit of code, we write a function called test get issuer for visa and we pasted it, right? This is like the usual thing we would do. But an IDE like this can help you in this case. So let's just highlight these two lines, right click, refactor, extract a method. The, there are keyboard shortcuts, so you don't have to like do it all the time. You can use the keyboard shortcut. So then, then I give the method name, which in this case is test get issuer for MasterCard. You press enter. Okay, so it creates a new function. And what it does is it replaces the definition with the reference. So you don't have to like do it all the time. It's much more easier to do. No. So we forgot to like call these. So let's call this guy. And again, it's command alt -rem on a Mac. Um, and the keyboard, it depends on the layout you're using. So all right, so test get issuer for Amex. Okay, it's pretty cool, uh, pretty cool. All right, let's run this. Okay, again, everything is back to working as it should. Uh, let's do something. I mean, uh, it's great, but I don't like the thing that everything starts with test underscore. It's like really monotonous, so I'm going to do something else. I'm going to change the name for, hey, like, let's just take this out. Okay. Let's just take this out first. We shouldn't be keeping that function here. All right. So let's change these names to, again, I'm going to use an IDE feature here. You can find it on any, yeah. So it's called the refactor rename. So you can just easily rename things and update the references. Do refactor. Or I could just be the lazy guy in the room and uh, yeah, there we go. And yeah, there we go. No, I'm just going to keep the MasterCard like this. Yeah. All right. Seems pretty good. Yep, all tests passed. Whatever. Yeah, working good. So we've done task two as well. We have three individual functions that like test whether the Visa, MasterCard, and American Express cards work. So just a disclaimer, if you're working on like an e-commerce site or doing something like this, don't do this. There are better ways to do this. So this is just for, you know, understanding the test tools. Don't use this code in production. Don't sue me if you, something happens, right? I should have had a like release, like don't, you can't sue me if something goes wrong. So. I forgot that. Oh my, it's too late already. Okay, let's just reflect on what we did. So, get uh, compare with branch step two. Okay. All right, so at first we made this into a function that's gone, of course. We made three separate function that does these things. And later we add like, if name is main, then run these functions. Don't you think it's a bit lazy that we're doing like this? I mean, technically a project should have like a thousand tests, like more than a thousand tests. If we all have to like write print this test passed or print this, I mean, this is a bit difficult to keep hold of. And again, we have to call like all the functions at the end of the module. This is, doesn't make sense. I think there should be a better way. I mean, we programmers are smart people. I mean, people hire us with this much amount of money and computer science programs are expensive because, you know, we're smart people. So we should find a better way to like get these tests running. Let's see if there's a better way. Let's, since we're done with step two, I guess it's okay if we move to step three. All right, so how do I close this? Yeah. So let's go to step three to see what we need to do. Okay. So, oh, we need to install a prerequisite at this point. 
uh, pip install pytest, um, and then go on with the thing. All right. So what are the things we need to do? We need to install pytest. We need to try to run pytest to automatically run the three tests we already written. And if they run, awesome. If they don't, we need to investigate why. OK. So let's do this. Let's install pytest. So at this point, some weird stuff happens when we first try to install a package. If you're not inside like virtual machine, a virtual environment or something, you're going like, to like get into a permission error or something. Um, so I hope you're ready to tackle that. So I'm using a virtual, virtual uh, environment. So I won't get into the permission thingy. So yeah, pip install pytest. Oh, looks like I had pytest installed already. So of course, why not? And I need to run pytest here. What? Collected zero items? Well, that, that's, that shouldn't have happened. OK. Um, is there something we did wrong? Uh, OK. Did you remember that we started this thing about like prefixing every test? with like test before it, not like having it as a suffix. I think that's something to do with this. Let's try this. I don't know if it's this going to work, but let's try test visa. All right. In the name of God, let's start this. Ooh, wow. Collected one item. Looks like they, having the test before and after does make a lot of difference. All right. Uh, I think we got this thing going, right, guys? I think we got this thing going. Test. Yeah. Let's run this. Test. Oh, yeah. Two, two items. Great. So again, test before. And then again, run the test. Oh, my. Three tests all got detected. Oh, let's not get lazy and like have test MasterCard test. We're not testing the test case of the MasterCard test. So yeah, there we go. Cool. We now have three tests running. Now. Um, this is one way to run tests. Um, I mean, uh, it doesn't have to like be any specific IDE. You can just use your terminal to like run pytest and get the things going. Um, if you want to see the test re results in detail, let me just do something. Let me just grab myself a terminal and run pytest source. Um, I forgot to like get into my virtual environment. All right, cool. We're in PyTest, right? It's cool and nice, but if you want to see it in much more detail, you can just set a verbose flag, V, and then you can see each of the tests that ran individually, like with their names and so on, the details. So you can see like tests, test issuers, double colon, and then the method that ran here. So yeah, cool. So we ran the tests automatically now. Um, but if you have a kick-ass IDE like uh, JetBrains um, PyCharm, you can do something. You can run the test in the IDE, actually. So I can click Add Configuration. And then a Python tests, PyTest. So add a PyTest here, uh, PyTest, all right. PyTest in bin, no. All right, I'm just going to run PyTest. Target not provided. OK, module name. So module is what? No, module on script path. Let's give the path. Um, OK, here's my path, PyCon APAC. All right, let's. All right, so you see now the tests ran within the IDE, and the IDE's interface is like giving you a better way to work with the tests. It took one millisecond to run the test, and yeah, pretty good. Now let's see what happens if something gets messed up. 
let's go to this the test and like change it make it like nine eight in this case this should raise an exception and let's see how that looks like overall so let's go to the I, I, ID let's go to the terminal and would you look at that what an interesting error message it actually like breaks down and gives you the source code and so that you can pinpoint your problem. You don't like have to wait or anything, like browse your uh, whole code base to find out what's wrong. And you see, it runs the whole test case and in, at the end, it said, this has failed. This didn't work out. And it tells you what the problem is. Yeah, right? So it tells you the problem. So it raises an exception. Okay, let's clear this up. Let's show another example. Let's start this with like, I don't know, 5.4. In that case, it gets, becomes a MasterCard. Do you see what it did there? It told you what went wrong. It told you it was supposed to get Visa, but it got MasterCard instead. It shows you the value right there. You don't have to like go through your source code or import your function in an uh, interactive console and check. It tells you right there in front of your face, hey, look. This is where you messed up. This is where you need to fix things. So now that I know that this is where I messed up, I can go back and fix it, you know? There we go. Back as usual. Now, everything passed. Now, you don't have to use PyTest. I mean, if you like, uh, I don't know, something like a nose or anything else, yeah, just use it, it's fine. Uh, I like PyTest um, because it has the name Pi in it. So maybe, I don't know. I like PyTest. Okay. So what did README say? Now, install PyTest. We did it. Uh, try to run PyTest. And if they run, awesome. And we investigate it. We fixed it. Now, one thing. Why did we have to prefix the functions with test? I mean, it could be like, uh, I don't know chicken burger underscore visa or mashed potato underscore MasterCard, but that doesn't work. So what's controlling this behavior? So you see, as programmers, it's important to know what's controlling this test underscore thing to work. So have you s seen something like tox.ini in any source code you've went through? tox.ini or pytest.ini? If you go to like a commercial project or like a big like package, you'll see that. So let's see, PyTest configuration. Let's Google this up. All right. Hmm. I mean, the best programmers always go to Stack Overflow first, but since we're not that good, we're going to the documentation. So, all right, let's see, test underscore, does it have anything like this? Uh-huh, no, prefix, something like this, no way. We're not that good of a developer, so we're just gonna go into like test underscore Python test. No, doesn't put up anything. Let's see, prefix, pytest, let's keep adding more keywords. Ah, changing the Python test discovery. I think we hit the jackpot. Okay, so you have a few ways to ignore paths, deselect tests, uh, keep duplicates and so on, changing the directory recursion. This is important because you don't want PyTest to like look in places there are no tests. It's gonna ra rise up the test time. So let's see. Changing the naming conventions. Now that's what we're looking for. So. Python underscore functions, uh, like you can change it. Star underscore check. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Let's do this, right? This was not in originally a part of the plan to do this, but I thought like, hey, why not, right? So I made a file called pytest.ini. If any of you ever used Windows and have seen autorun.ini, it's that thing. Um, I think I should not download this now. It's too. Okay, so let's just copy this in. So first we have a PyTest block, 
And let's do this like mm, mashed potato underscore star. So this is our discovery discovery pattern right there. So if we run PyTest now, it detects no tests because we changed the discovery algorithm. It's a discovery uh, string. So let's go back into the, let's make it mashed potato visa. OK? There you go. So that's why it's test underscore. It's a default value. You can change it to mashed potato, but don't do that because others will understand what mashed potato underscore visa means. Keep it test unless you absolutely need to. Don't even make it check. Test underscore. Because Python developers understand that. Do you know why you use self? We could have made it like this underscore object because it gets injected during when you like do a method. Let me just show you what I mean. You see, when we write a class, um, we usually do this, like right? class potato, and you make a function uh, def give potato, right? You see, the IDE automatically says this is self, right? It doesn't have to be. You can make it myself and my thoughts. <laughs> it's perfectly legal Python. But if you were to do this, and, this uh, uh, and a psychotic Python programmer saw this, and he knew your home address, that wouldn't be a good, good day for you. So don't do this. Follow the conventions. Keep it self. You can't customize, doesn't mean you have to. Some things are left better the way they are, like the atmosphere. So yeah, let's not do this. Let's not do this. Let's just forget this all ever happened. And yeah, let's run this, see if everything's OK. Oh, it's still mashed potato, so better make it test visa again before we screw up anything more. So yeah, there we go. Everything's working as normal. All right, it's time to do a commit. OK, let's see what, what we changed here. So this is the change we made. I see the color is a bit difficult to understand on the board. So um, I'm just going to change it a bit. I mean, on the screen, it looks perfect. But on, on the projection, it's a bit difficult. Um, red. I think you will be able to see this red. Can you read the red text now? Yeah, cool. So we changed this line from visa test to test visa because the prefix is set up that way by default. And we should follow this uh, pattern. All right. Let's do a comment now. What's the comment message again? I fixed bugs. Feed me chicken. OK. Oh, I didn't uh, add the changes. All right, cool. All right, there we go. OK, so now we had gone through a very uh, useless and quite rather large um, session, a quite la rather large step. Pardon me. So, so thus far, do you have anything like itchy, like maybe this shouldn't have been done, done this way, anything that you want to say, but is like, OK, maybe the other people got in the room. I'm, I didn't get it. Maybe I'm stupid. Sure, please. Uh, what is the default behavior if it doesn't find the function that you specified? The default behavior is it will say, I didn't find any. I'm sorry. And you, can you turn that off? Just say, just, if you don't find it, just ignore it. Um, so here's the thing, right? Um, do you know how like Unix has return values, like Unix functions? They often, like when you wrote your first C program, you said return 0 or return 1. So when it doesn't find anything, it just returns 0. So to your build system or to any program that's observing it, it's OK. It's OK to not have any tests. But if a test fails, then it says it's an error. But if there are no tests, it's fine. Uh-huh. 
somehow the function that it's testing mm -hmm. is not there, will it throw an error? Of course, because yeah. it won't be able to import it, right? So in that case, if, it, if something that like that happens, you can ignore the test in the configuration like we saw. You can ignore it, you can delete it, you can comment it out or do something like that, just to make sure that the, your whole workflow doesn't get stopped by this thing. I mean, if you have a complicated CI CD system or continuous integration delivery system that like depends on the all tests passing, in that case, you might want to comment that out. That's it. Any more questions? Um, guys, if there are any. Awesome. All right. We are in step four. So what does this step have for us? Let's go to step four. Okay. So here are the instructions. So yeah, running test is PyTest, duh. Okay, so fix the functionality of the get issuer function so that the tests pass. Write a test case for checking the value error for unknown card types. Mm. Let's see the code base. I'm not sure what this means until I see the code. Okay, let's see. I checked out. So in issuers. Oh, look what happened. We have a regular expression now. And it's much more easier to read. That's great. Uh, someone, some cool guy did the refactoring for us. Yay, cool. So yeah, let's run the tests. So while I'm testing, so here's the thing, right? Uh, I used to not know how to write regular expressions. Like when I did, end up writing a regular expression that works, I felt like, I don't know, I cracked quantum computing or something. It's like, uh, whoa, it worked. Oh, it didn't work. <clears throat> okay. I mean, I mean, come on. Like all of the tests failed except one? You've got to be kidding me. Oh, at least now it's better because it's telling us what's wrong. That is everything. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you. Ah, okay. So which one do we start with? I guess MasterCard. So what's wrong is we should have gotten MasterCard, but we got Visa. We should have gotten Amer American Express, but we got Visa. What? I think there's something with this Visa thing because this Visa thing's coming up every everywhere. Let's see. Let's see the code. I think there's something wrong. Um, uh, the regex looks good. Uh, oh, I think we're matching against everything, right? Let's try. This. Is that the case? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm so confused now. Let's open the console. I I don't know. It's so confusing. A uh, Python. All right. Um, I like to copy code a lot more than you should. So from card validator dot, what's the file? Issuers import get issuer. All right. Let's see. Mm, potato crackers. Oh, OK. Uh, I don't know. Egg McMuffin. Oh, that's also a Visa card. I, wow, like uh, this is a payment gateway I'd love, love to buy chickens with. Uh, mm, pardon me. Um, so what's wrong here? Uh, I don't know. This seems so weird. Visa card starts with four, right? Yeah. We're checking if, oh, there's no four? Oh, my. Yeah, so it needs to start with a four. Start with a four. I think that's how you start with the four, right? Start with a four. Yeah, so okay. Okay, let's save this. Let's see what happens now. All right, exit. Um, all right, we have two tests passing now, so that's good news. I mean, um, yeah, like, okay. 
So first, oh, now it's saying like both of the cards for like MX and unknown issuer, both, both tests are failing. So unknown numbers is failing and American Express too, whoa. Okay, what's wrong there? Uh, let's see if, if the test case is right. I mean, this should be the first case. It's like three, four, six. Um, according to the business logic we had, uh, three, four is actually valid. Um, uh, let's just zoom in on the on these. Hmm. Visa is okay, MasterCard is okay, and we do have 347. I'm not sure what's wrong here. Maybe close it into, yeah, <laughs> 427. Um, you mean yeah. like Same here? Business. Yeah. Yeah, it's like 3 and 4 and 7. Is it, yeah. That's correct, right? I mean, it said 347. I mean. Like close it like that one on yeah. the MasterCard one. Oh, one. you make, make it optional, like yeah. two choices? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the thing. Let's do this. Let's see if that works. Um, so something like this, right? Yeah. So 4-7. Um, 4-7, are you sure? 3, 4, 3, 7, right? Yeah, 3, 4, 3, 7. Um, okay. Or All right, so in this case, let's just consult someone I always trust. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You thought I'm going to write Stack Overflow, but no, 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 no. All right, so I love these like online regex testing apps because I'm very confident with my skills. Not that I'm insecure or anything, but yeah. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, shouldn't pass. Uh, okay, it, 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 it matches, I mean. Yeah, sure, okay. And another with 3.7, does it match with 3.7? Yep, all right, so that worked. Okay, let's, let's try this, oh yeah. Yeah, three pass, like one left, one left, oh my, the, the pressure's up, the pressure's up now. Um, okay, so uh, this is like unknown card type. I mean, it's correct. I mean, why does it say it's, it's wrong? It, it's correct. I mean, we don't have a logic for 946. I mean, all right. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here anymore. I'm so in doubt with my life choices. Uh, I, we did these like pytest.raises. I mean, that's the thing you used to detect exceptions. We did detect it. it it should work, but I'm not sure what's going on here. I mean, we are raising an exception, and we are catching the exception here. But what do you think the problem is? Um, it's so confusing. Oh, it's raising a value error. Yeah, but it, oh yeah, we're catching a lookup error. What the, come on, how could I miss that? All right. Let's let's just get back. Let's run the tests. Oh yeah, all four pass, hundred percent. Oh, looks like it's a problem with the test anyway. The code was okay. All right. So let's see. What did we change here? Uh huh. So first step was changing the regular expression here because. I'm very good with the regular expressions. I mean, I'm an expert. I do consultancy on regex. So I changed these. And here, so this was raising an incorrect, it is looking for the incorrect exception. We decided to use value error, but was looking for a lookup error. Uh, so this shouldn't be a lookup error because it, the user is different, which it should be a value error. So yeah, we are done. Just to double check if things are working. I don't trust myself with code. Oh, it's working. Yeah. So let's add these and make a commit. Again, what? I fix bugs, give feed me chicken. No. I want 
feed me um, spaghetti. All right, cool. Now that we're done with step four, right? Yeah, step four. So, uh, do you have any confusion, any questions like what we did, any questionable things we did? Like anything you have like in your mind that you want to ask? Anything? I think that means a no. So, speaking of exceptions, I mean, uh, how many times do you guys like actually define your own exception class? So, the, every time I defined my own exception class, I, inst I regretted it after six months because I forgot what it does. And then I like went back to using like value error or lookup error because that covers almost all the use cases. So, writing like custom exceptions was like, a bad thing for me at least. I don't know about you guys. It made me suffer a lot. All right, let's go to check out to step five. All right, let's see what step five has for in for us. I feel like these test suites were designed to make me like feel anxious or something. I mean, I can't find anything here. Defective by design. Okay. Now, case class, maybe valid credit card test, turn the functions into methods of the class, write another test case class, maybe credit key card issue or confusion test to cover negating cases in valid card numbers like Visa marked as MasterCard. Ah, all right. So, one thing is evident here, like developers shouldn't be naming stuff first of all, but we have to name stuff, so it's quite counterintuitive, so yeah, let's go. All right, we're here, so the guy, so the, the repo told us to make this a class, that's easy, I'm gonna make this a class, oh yeah, class, this is my test, yo, I don't know, yeah, let's do this. Oh yeah, let's run the tests. I wrote, a te I wrote a class and it's properly indented. I didn't like do like those JavaScript mistakes or so or whatever. Yeah, let's do this. What? I had like a thousand tests. Okay, I think maybe because I didn't like indent this, it's like that happened. Oh, hmm. That shouldn't have been the case. Uh, Oh, I see a bit of red here. Method must have a first parameter, usually called self. Uh, okay. I'm going to call you myself, therefore I am. Because it's the best thing to do, right? All right. There we go. Ah, that didn't work too. So, oh. I think I know what's wrong here. Do you remember the documentation? It had this weird option, you see? Python classes. That means the classes names are also checked by PyTest. So it's probably test. Yeah, it's probably test. Let's see. I need to start the name of the class with test. So I think the guy who suggested the name was OK, I guess. Uh, Test valid credit card. Yeah, all right. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that worked, that worked. Cool. But one thing is still itching my mind is this guy told like to write a test case class, which assumes like there is something called a test case uh, somewhere. Let's just do a Google on this. Ah, what do you know? Python has a unit testing framework built in. All right, let's go in here and see what's up. All right, test case. There we go, we found it, test case. 
So I have this neat little thing called dash. I li I love it. So if I just write the name of a like class or anything, uh, it just brings out the documentation, which is like fantastic. Um, so, yeah, what's test case? It's instances of the test case class represent the logical testing units in the unit test universe. I'm not sure if I'm reading a Star Wars novel or a documentation, but yeah. I think I will skip this. Oh, no. Oh, okay. So, it has some pretty neat things, you see method called to prepare test fixture and method called immediately after like it's done. Oh, so it's like a way to like do repetitive things like before and after your test. Like one of the things could be like before you run a test on Django, you might want to like create an object or something, maybe populate the database a bit and then run the tests. It's for that. So I don't think we will be needing this here. But still, nevertheless, let's just uh, have it to see if anything changes or anything. All right, let's do, let's inherit from test case and import uh, unit tests, the test case and run this. Yep, works the same. And one fun thing about this experience is that if you have, like if your class like inherits from test case, uh, your, your name can be anything, like your name can be, uh, what was that thing I ate last day? I forgot. I love to name things by food, so let's just name it water. I don't know. See, even water gets detected because it's like inherited from the test case class. So yeah, why not? But do you like to keep the name water? I wouldn't because a psychotic Python programmer might, might know my home address. So I'm just going to keep it the way it was whether I inherit from test case or not. All right. And I should not keep this as this because again, I'm scared for my life in a way. So I'm just going to put them back to how Python loves it. There we go. Doesn't it look nice now? Okay. I forgot what we we're supposed to do. Turn the functions into method of the class. Yeah, we did it. We did it. Yeah. Write another test case class, maybe a card issuer confusion test to cover negating class cases. I think what I was trying to say here, if I'm correct, because I don't for, I forgot what I, the intention was, I think, was to do negative testing, like whether like a MasterCard get detects, detected as a Visa or so what. So we do these random checks, right? So, okay, uh, maybe another test class. Sure, why not? Of course. Okay, let's do another class and inherit from test case. All right, we're there. So, here we'll write a bunch of random tests. So, we're going to do def test visa length. So, what we're going to do here is you see, if you read like a software engineering book or something, if they have a chapter on testing, they're going to use this pretty interesting uh, vocabulary like uh, black box testing, white box testing, whatever. And they have these things like two techniques, uh, boundary value analysis and things like that. And we're not going to name those things, but just know the concepts. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take our function to the limit. You see, to the limit, to the limit where it might break. It's, for example, one limiting test might be like a Visa card should have 16 digits. Not 17, not 15, 16. So we're going to check the boundary. We're going to check whether it fails for 15 and 17. That's a good enough test. So you see, um, this is not the best way to write the tests, but this is uh, okay to get started with. Basically, what I have seen, like, like most of software engineering, like any discipline, the more tests you write, the more you, you like make things work the way they're supposed not supposed to work, the better you get. So make mistakes and learn from the mistakes. So let's do this. All right. 
Now we're going to do uh, what? Let write an assertion, get issuer. Now we're going to write a 15 digit Visa card. So four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever. Is it 15 digits? I get so perplexed. Okay, 15 digits. Yeah, sure. Now, this should raise an exception. So, yeah, let's test this. And this should raise an exception if we have two digits more. So, that's 17 digits. That should raise an exception. Now, let's test if, if our program is actually resilient to these types of... Oh, it didn't let me finish the sentence as well. So we need to like enforce the um, length check. All right, sure, why not? Let's go to the test, let's go to here. Let's, uh, now, the f it should start with like four, but have 15 digits afterwards. So I'm gonna do D15 and the dollar means that it should end. So it ends right there. So D four is there, and except four, there should be 15 other digits after it, and then it's done, over, gone, poof. All right, so let's do this. Oh yeah, yeah, that worked. So there we go. And I think we need to like do the same thing with MasterCard, but in case of MasterCard, yeah, let's do the same. Let's do D15 and dollar. All right. So, yeah, that looks good. Let's do the same test for MasterCard. Um, in this test, of course, I'm going to do 4.5 to 5.1 and 5.1 because that's a valid range. And, yeah, MasterCard length, whatever. Mm-hmm, let's run. Oh. Looks like uh, that didn't work out now, did it? Oh, I think what's, oh yeah, of course, because we have two digits ahead being checked and like we need to de decrease the digit count over s this side. There should be 14 more because let me just check if my mathematics are correct. 16 minus 2. Yep. You see, I love this thing about Python. Like whenever I can't find a calculator or I'm like too nerdy to open the calculator app on your laptop, you can just use Python. That's fun. Okay, let's test. Oh yeah, we have MasterCard covered. Now, the time finally for American Express. Now we know that this should be 4-7 like this because of course we fixed that in the previous session. And it should be the same, right, 14? Yeah, let's do this. Let's just be sure. I mean, when I open up my American Express card, it seems, Odd. Let me just check. How many digits are in American Express Card? Wow, it's such a popular question. Oh my, oh my. I'm pretty sure developers were like searching this all the time. Oh, 15 digits. So it's like one digit less. So again, we ask Python, what's that? 15 minus 2, that's 13. All right. All right, so let's do this. 13. Hmm, okay. 13, uh huh. So there are how many digits? 14. So, mm hmm. And let's just check. I'm so unconfident with my like other skills that I just leave Python to do everything for me. Len, yep, what's the length of this? It should be like uh, 12 
Oh, it's 14. It should be 12. All right. This is the lower boundary. Oh, no, it shouldn't be 12. It should be 14. Yeah, that was correct. Oh, my. And we should add like two more and 16. They should be invalid. Okay. Okay. Now it should pass. Uh, uh huh. There we go. Pi test. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. What, 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 what went wrong here exactly? Oh, it should be 13. We just calculated that with like advanced uh, NumPy operations and so on. Yeah. Okay, it's still a value error. Oh, it's about MasterCard. Uh huh. Let's just go to the source code. I'm not sure where. Uh, what happened? Oh, we have the like same method. Ah, you see, that's why. If developers were careful enough and like were caring enough about their code, uh, we wouldn't have JetBrains as the sponsor of this event. So thank you, developers. Uh, okay, Amex. Thanks, JetBrains. All right. I think someone's messing with me. I mean, just come on. What's wrong now? Uh, did not raise value error on this. Guys, you just need to help me out because someone's messing with me. I'm not sure someone, so a hacker took over my computer or something. Uh, what's wrong here? I mean, I can see that it's, it's very evident and it's very clear the regex is okay. I mean, it starts with three, then there's four, seven, and then 13 numbers. Um, hmm. The dollar sign. Oh, yeah, it's dollar sign. Yeah, it means in regex that it ends with that. Okay, let me put the boundary here. It ends. Uh, <clears throat> oh, okay, 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 what? Wait, wait, wait. You see, now we introduced another problem. The initial test we wrote for American Express, that had more than 15 or less than 15 digits because we were too ignorant. Yeah, let's see the test. How many digits does it have? Let's check Python. Okay, let's not use Python, let's, let's use bash this time. Oh yeah. Oh, there are 17 digits. So let's do this and let's make it 15 digits. Just to double check with bash. Okay, it's now 15. Mm -hmm. There we go. Let's run pi test. Whoa. That also failed. Okay, let's just count this again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. What? Okay. Let's just add one more. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I fixed the previous test because here's the thing. In reality, you won't write the perfect test. Your test might be wrong. If you discover it in the future, just make sure to like put the effort to fix it. All right. So uh, the final thing is with, again, with Amex length. Um, let's go to issuers. Let's... Okay, it starts with 3, 4, then it's 13, but it fails with the second test, which is like, did not raise value error. Hmm, I wonder what's wrong. Has anyone here used PDB or the Python debugger? Okay, let's, let's do that now. So, what you, a neat thing you can do is, you can pass an argument called PDB, and it will drop you in the shell exactly where that thing happened, right? So there I am in the shell. Now, I can do this. I can get the exact same environment. Okay, so it gives MasterCard, interesting. 
ok ok um, the original statement was this so let us hmm. 16 is for MasterCard, yeah, but it is not raising an extra, oh, it should be like 17 digits, right? The upper bound test, oh my, yeah, of course. We have like 16 digits here. Let us count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, oh no, we are going in the wrong direction again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, it has 17. Oh, what's wrong here? Can anyone guess what's wrong here? Because I'm just totally lost at this point. Oh, it's the Amex. Why are we checking MasterCard? Come on. Oh, I mean, seriously, guys, like we've been testing the Amex length with the MasterCard. Uh, guys, just being honest. I have been acting out a lot, but in this time I seriously like <laughs> got lost. <laughs> like what happened? Like, this was serious guys, this, I, I wouldn't act it out, come on. I am not that good of an actor. If I was, I would just call Hollywood right now, like guys, I am here. Okay, so now we have these tests passing, that is great. Are we done with our objective now? That is the question. Uh, what was our objective? Okay. So, yeah, we wrote some tests. Yeah, we, we like solidified our logic a bit. Yeah, our online shop will not get ripped off that easily. It will, but that not easily though. Um, git add again. Let us just commit this over just to be good people. Commit. Okay. I ate spaghetti now. Um, what is the other thing I ate this morning? Um, feed me a apple gulp, whatever. All right, so cool. Now let us check what we did, right? Since I forgot to show you the diff, I will, um, hmm, there we go. So here is what we changed. We added the boundaries and the length checks to make sure that the correct lengths are being checked with and so on um, for this. Then we like, f without any reason, we, because we felt good, we imported test case and then we like made it into a test class and um, yeah. And we wrote like length tests as well. So yeah, that's been the changes so far. So let's just go back and take a look at your code base. View distraction free mode, interpresentation mode. Okay. Okay. So here's here's our tests. We have um, this thing right over here. Um, testing the generic good good times cases. We have then another class that tests the case where. It might be a bit confusing. Numbers might be here and there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So far, we're doing great. Now, how do I get out of this? Oh, cool. All right. So now we're done with almost half of our entire agenda. It's more than half, actually. We're done with uh, now. Since I'm bad at mathematics, now let's just. Uh, Again, so 5 by A into 100. We are done with 62.5% of our agenda, right? So, actually no. I just remembered I added another chapter last night. That is 55.55%, but still that is more than half of our agenda. We are done with it. Um, actually, with the knowledge you have right now, you can just go back home and uh, like, count for your past sins that you have done without writing tests. You can start redemption, but yeah, you should, you know. But still, I'd suggest you to stick around, learn a bit more, then it, it will be much easier for you to like plunge. 
down that. So we're on step six. Before we move on, do you have any confusion that I might cater to? That means a no. That means either. So I am. I was doing like this uh, lect yeah, class of um, what was that um, of English. So there, our professor said, "Look, you even in the whole semester, very few people ask me questions, and especially you didn't ask me any questions. What do you know? What does that mean?" I said, um, "No, professor, I'm not sure. That you have been either sleeping or you understood everything." So yeah. And the fun thing is, I actually slept a lot in that semester. Um, he noticed. Um, I did, um, but I did get good grades in the end. So yeah, I'm happy. All right, <coughs> pardon me. Let's see now what step six has for us. OK. Now, like we are bringing in the Pythonic <laughs> principles uh, in like our testing, the principles we follow, the principles that Java developers can't understand why we code like this. Things like do not repeat yourself. Things like uh, flat is better than nested. Those things we're gonna bring them in. So let's see. Um, do you know about this? Do you know about this? Of course you do. So what we believe is simple, it's always better than complex. Flat is better than nested. Readability counts. The kind of test we have written is like the same thing over and over again. And you know a good thing about our brains is if it sees the same thing over and over again, it stops caring about it. So we need to make sure that our brains don't stop caring about it because then we are in trouble. The project is in trouble. So what do we do? We can use some of the features PyTest gives us to like go over that, right? So let's just go through this uh, before. So a few things, um, like these two lines are my favorite. If the implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea. If the implementation is easy to explain, it might be a good idea. And of course, special cases are special enough to break the rules. I think as developers, we always think that, oh my god, the, the thing I'm working on is so special. It's like a unicorn and thing, right? So, so that, that, that those guys who made Python, no, no, they have no idea what my case is. They aren't in my shoes, right? But yeah, they said it, special cases aren't special enough. Usually, of course, if you're like uh, writing the program for Apollo 13 or something, yeah, sure. Okay, so now the guide tells us to look up on parameterization on PyTest. Looks like I was not lazy enough to skip linking. I actually linked myself. All right, there we go. Just in case we get lost, I'm just going to open this up in a new tab. All right. So it's again, it's like a PyTest thing. It's not like it doesn't come with Python by default. So PyTest has a few things up your sleeve. Like, all uh, right, you have like uh, fixtures. I'm not going to go into much detail. So let me just show you what parameterize does. Just see the example here, and you can just easily understand what it does. Here's this function. We're taking two inputs, and the inputs are described here. Test input and expected. All right, that's good enough. And then we have like a few examples. What's the input? What's the expectation? Whether they meet them? And I didn't write the same test three times. I just gave them the three examples. So my eyes won't get tired. I can just see all of the examples at once. Let's do this. Let's fix this. Let's go back. I'm going to make sure that I'm in git, ch git checkout, hackout. Oh no, checkout. Step six. Yes, we are in step six. All right, so now 
uh, we are going to do what again? Parameterize as many tests as you can. So I am immediately sure that I can parameterize this, these three tests, they can be easily like done. So let's do this, right? At pytest dot mark dot parameterize. The first argument is arg names and then the arg values. So one mistake I often do is I pass like lists, but this is not a list. This is a string which has the argument names separated by a comma. So this is a string, okay? This is not a list. It's gonna be a card number, I guess number, and issuer. I think it's fine. And then we give the arg values. So we pop up, pop up a list and the, let's just copy these over. Copy, copy. So I did this by pressing command D in th this case, like it's gonna be, make it easier for me to copy things. Copy, 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 and copy. All right, so I'm just gonna delete the rest. And it's not test visa, it's like test identification, uh, whatever, yeah. Let's run the test. Yeah, pytest v. Oh wow, everything passed, that's amazing. Oh no, yeah, we forgot to like consider the, these two variables. So we need to take in number and issuer. Uh, here's a fun thing, right? If you didn't notice, like it gives you the suggestion like you didn't give the arguments, so if you use like Visual Studio Code or this, this is really good. Of course, some people like to use Vim as their code editor. I'm not sure if that does it, so yeah. Uh, number and issuer. So one liner test now, number, issuer, there we go. Now we like reduced our line, line count. Oh, <clears throat> oh my. What had just happened? You see, here's the thing, right? Sometimes Python can be a bit fussy about a few things. Uh, it's not the fault of Python, of course, again. You see what's happening here, if you look closely on how Python works. Um, Python injects itself, right? But when you use the parameterize like a decorator, it expects these to be in series, right? In serial. So he, in, instead of self, it expected to number. And it, instead of like number, it expected issuer. So this shouldn't be here. So the easiest fix for now for the workshop is to just say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to use you. It's fine. I'm just going to rename the test so that like the test runner gets it. Oh yeah. Did you see what happened this time? Test identification. You have the, the um, test case, the number and what it should have been. The number, what it should have been. The number, what it should have been. And they passed. So you didn't have to write a lot of spaghetti code, a lot of like repeating things, copy paste, not at all. Um, yeah, so let's see how much uh, it differs. So let's just compare with step six. Yeah, there we go. And so three functions. We have one function which looks great. We don't have to see the same thing over and over again. And uh, I do remember the thing about flat is better than nested. So in this case, my opinion is to like make this a function. And many people will treat this in different ways, but personally for me, I think this looks good. It's not like all the way indented over there. It looks good for me, so yeah. Okay. Oh, there's no self. 
yeah, of course. There is no self. There is no self being injected. And yeah, there we go. Flat is better than nested. And the cool part is like, since like, it's not like overflowing of the, because of the class name. That's cool, I guess. All right. So yeah, there there are the f there are a few things more uh, right down there. Um, I actually wrote a few like random tests, so you can just work on them if you want to. But we're not gonna like bother with this class anyways. So here's the idea entirely. Just inject the names, inject the values, you get them here, you do the same thing over and over again. PyTest takes care of everything, so yeah. So the PyTest.mark is an interesting thing because uh, you can do a lot of things with it uh, that's specific to PyTest. Like for example, if you're using Django, you'd need to use another mark called Django underscore DB and that would allow you to access the database, otherwise it won't like allow you to access the database. Um, so, yeah, that's something to look out for in your tests. All right. So, yep, we're almost at the end. Wow. Now, would you look at that? All of these lines of code, boom. And we have good few lines of code that's easy to understand. All right. So, Let's now commit this and git commit. Okay, I want, I had a f so many dishes. Now what do I want now? I had spaghetti, uh, I'll have maybe, I don't know. Let's just change the message. There was no bugs, okay. Always use emoticons like in your me message because otherwise people, people won't think that you're a professional. To be a professional, you need to use emoticons in your comment messages, all right? This is like the best thing you can do. So git, git, check out. Git, check out. And we're going to go into step seven. All right. Whew, this has been quite a long journey. Okay. All right. So now part seven is, uh, I'm still having doubts whether I should continue with part seven because it's uh, a bit difficult to follow and it's not as straightforward as the previous one. So here's the idea, right, with part seven. Part seven is all about mocking. Now I think if you have like talk to any guy or any, any woman who's like, into testing and if they didn't say mock or stub in like 10 seconds within the conversation like you're lucky so it's really like the thing and so what are these um, let's yeah let's see what these are so essentially you have your application and your application has a specific, a specific functionality which is within the application but sometimes as in most times what happens is your application has an external dependency that's somewhere else that's beyond your control. For example, um, the internet, it can just go away. It, the Wi-Fi connection might die. The hard disk, it might crash. Your SSD might burn, you see. Or maybe say, mm, Trump, he might build the wall. You see, those things are beyond your control, right? So what's these, since these are beyond your control, if your tests depend on these, your tests are beyond your control, right? You cannot control your tests. So have you heard the word like control environment or something like this that statisticians sometimes use like control group? So what happens is like we control this and we need to control the environment, but since uh, the internet isn't something we can predict or the hard drive, we need to throw it away and replace it with a mock. So what does it do? So what ends up happening is we do a hot swapping of things 
we replace the actual implementation of something and replace it with a mock. And the mock to the thing that calls the mock, it behaves exactly the same. It returns the same values. And the attributes are the same, but we are mocking the attributes. For example, anyone here used requests as the library to do HTTP requests? Anyone? Requests or URL lib? So we do that, we use that to do HTTP requests, right? And it might happen that there is no internet connectivity at the moment. Or we want to check for, like our application, we might want to test what happens when there is no internet. We actually want that to happen. So what do we do? Do we like turn off the Wi-Fi, run the test, then turn the Wi-Fi on again, then run the rest of the tests? Probably not. Oh, maybe well, one thing. Maybe write a script that disconnects the internet, then runs the test, then connects the internet, then runs the rest of the tests. Maybe not. Maybe not. that's not the way to go. That's why we do mocks. So what is a mock? Um, the easiest way to explain a mock is to show it. All right, let's just make a mock. And I will use the uh, Python shell again to like make things like easily understandable. Python. Come on, I just, mm -hmm. all right. So from unit test, import mock. Oh, it's not in unit test? Where is it? Mock Python. Oh, I, I remember I have dash, so let's do mock. Oh, it's in unit test.mock.mock, .mock .mock, so yeah. From unit test.mock import mock. All right, so. Are you ready for this? I'm not sure if you are. So say get response is a mock. Return value is right. Okay, so what is get response? It's a mock. Let's try calling get response. Okay, now let's do something else. Let's do something even more fun. Okay, so my response is um, requests.get HTTP uh, pycon.python.ph. You see the delay there? That was the I.O. We're talking over the network and fetching in some details. So what does a response have? For example, say we want to check whether the status code is 200 in some place of the logic. We, want, we have that check, right? So which means that we check that if response.status code, uh, the status code is 200, which is true. Now how can we mock this behavior? We can mock this like this. We create a mock again. So response mocked becomes a mock. Right, and then uh, what we end up doing is dot status code okay, so now response mocked dot status code is that so you can like make anything you want, make it have any val any value you want. And it's still going to work. So let me just do something like this. That's something crazy, like response mocked dot values dot get equals a mock with a return value. You ain't getting me. Mm, just I forgot to escape some of these. Um, yeah, there we go. So response mocked dot values dot get. I, I pass in like, give me my value, right? There we go. So we can pretty much replicate any behavior we want with a mock. Now with mock comes patch. 
I'm gonna sh d d demonstrate a patch, but for now, like, are you sh are you like getting it? What mocks about? Let's get intuition. Like, it's a super customizable object that you can make and make it do like anything, right? You don't have to write the function. You can give these things like, hey, return this value, like, or hey, this should be the function. Um, so uh, yeah, you can do it, make it do pretty much anything you want. And now. I'm saving a screenshot of this, just in case I can upload later. I just took the screenshot. All right. So let's try this, OK? Let's see what's in steps, uh, this step. Git checkout, step seven. OK, I'm already on step seven. OK, thank you. So essentially, now we have like two classes. All right. So this is an example of like usually when you shouldn't have a class, but you feel like writing one. Uh, that's why you write it. Yeah. So this is that. So I wrote, I read a like a good article. Like if your function has like two methods, one is init and something is else, you should. That's that's a function. That's a just a function. That's not a class. If a class has only init and that, this is like worse than that. It doesn't even have an init. Like, but yeah, this is a bad bad way to do this, but still, yeah, sure, why not? So this just is calling that function. So let's fix that. Let's just not have this around. Um, or maybe just keep it, yeah, keep it that way, because bad code is good. All right, so here's the thing, right? Uh, we have this remote credit card checker that uses some sort of API to check it. And we have a local implementation in this local credit card checker. So let's go to the readme and see what's, what's really up here. Um, here's a readme. We need to use the get issuer from API function to get the issuer, uh, write tests for get issuer from API, turn off the internet, feel like hope probably ran out, and then start mocking. OK, I think pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward um, at this point. Um, pardon me. Mm. So let me just give you a backstory of this API. You see, uh, yesterday while like I was uh, down upstairs, I made this Flask application that like does the same thing, but with an API. So it's nothing like don't use it in production or anything. I'm going to turn it off tonight. So yeah, don't use it. It's the same thing, just as an API in Flask. So here's how you do this, right? Um, let's just take this um, to your code base, copy this. And you see a post request here. I'm just going to replace totally with this. I'm not sure why I even did that. This is what happens when you do things late night. All right. Um, I'm going to make this a constant uh, API URL. Okay. It's just, I just put it here, just so that like, it doesn't get in the way of viewing what's going on. It's the same thing. And we post the number as like the actual number, right? So now let's see if it works. OK, let's exit from here. We won't be needing you anymore. All right, so from card validator dot issuers, import get issuer from remote. From remote? No, that's not the name. Oh, from API. OK. All right. So let's run this. And we're going to give an ID 48, blah, 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 blah. blah. Do you see the lag there? Service unavailable for URL this. That's great. Probably Python anywhere, like turn it off or something. But here's the thing, right? This is like the first example. If an online service is down, then like your application will not work. You need a way to make this pass, which is great, because now we can. Um, we have actually have this thing down. So just to give you guys an idea of how it should have worked, um,
Oh, it's actually working. I wonder what I did wrong. Oh, yeah. I think what I did is in the source code, I put an API version 3. It should be version 1. Oh, wow. OK. Let's just redo the thing. OK, import. Oh, it's still uh, method not allowed for, wait, what? Did we still do something wrong? Oh, we forgot the slash because, yeah. All right, let's do this again. OK. Issue, key error, issue est. Oh, it should have been issuer. Let's just fix this. Uh, if we check the response here, yeah, it's a result. So let's just go there and fix it, make it result. Yeah, that, yeah, that's working. Cool. Uh, let's run this again. All right. That worked. Sorry. Yeah, that worked. Um, it got Visa, so it's working. It's, it's getting it from the API. Now we need a way to predictably test this because if we just turn off the Wi-Fi connection, oh boy, this API is going to stop working. This function is going to stop working. The test is going to fail. Um, let's write the test first with like the connection on. Um, let's do this. I'm going to like take this. And test rem uh, API. So in this case, we're going to do like get issuer API. OK, cool. All right, let's run this and see how it takes care of things. Pi test. Verbus. Okay. So there is no result. All right. Then we have to investigate what's wrong here. Did you notice the lag that we're getting? It's from the HTTP request thing. So not only it's unpredictable whether the test will run or not. Uh, whether the test will pass or not, there's a delay. And the rule of thumb with unit tests, like it shouldn't take more than a few seconds to test your entire application with unit tests, right? So there shouldn't be any API calls or anything in that manner. So let's see what happens. What data did we get? Oh, see? In this case, what happened is we got unknown card type for some reason. Okay, we need to handle these situations here. So, the first observation of us is that this test is wrong. Although we're testing the same functionality, we shouldn't be testing this. Because honestly, what is this testing? It's testing whether that API is working correctly. But that's not my concern, whether that API is working correctly. It's that API maintainer's concern or another project's concern. My concern is whether that API is getting called the way it should have been. So that's my concern. So we're going to just uh, see, in this case, of course, we're not going to see how we check whether it's been called correctly, or maybe we will. We're going to check like if the response is parsed, parsed correctly in this end, right? So let's do this. Let's first observe the API in action. Um, Here's the API. We have Postman. Um, and if we give a valid number and send a request, um, we get a 200 OK as a status code. I think it's too small to see. I'm just going to say it out loud. And like we have the like result who like issued the card. Um, I think I need to like zoom this in. I'm not sure if it, ah, it works. OK. It's 200 OK, and it's like this. So if I give like uh, 88 or something, then it, 
it's, it's going to give you uh, a like unknown card type as the number. So the API wasn't designed. I was supposed to give this a result, but then again, it's a badly designed API. And honestly, like you don't get too many well designed APIs when you like in production. Not everything is a Twitter API. So yep, come on. Okay. Now we need to write a good test for this. And what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna collapse everything and just start writing in a distraction free. So test API calls, I guess, maybe that, maybe. Okay. First thing I'm gonna test is whether a successful result can get parsed by the system, right? Okay, so we're gonna do test okay result, right? What we're gonna do here is again get issuer from API. In this case, we're going to be calling with say a number like four, uh, like this, whatever. And let's make it three with three because it it shouldn't be like uh, anything valid or anything. Just something, any uh, random number, anything would do. Now, if we run the test, let's see what happens. It of course fails, right? Because the data here is like unknown card type. Um, but the thing is, we shouldn't let this API call take place in the first place. So we need to override how the request.get thing works. We need to like change its behavior. Now, how do we do that? I mean, request.get is a third party library, requests. And dot get is defined in that library. How can we like change the behavior. So that's where patch comes in. So let's try patch. So I'm uh, doing a patch. So here it's uh, decorator. I'm going to import it. Um, sorry. You need to import from unit test dot mock dot patch. Right? There we go. Okay. Now here's patch. Now what are we going to patch? We're going to patch requests dot get all right um, yeah so request dot get yep and we're gonna pass in a mock so I'm gonna say the return now how does patch work again let's just check on patch Python because most of the time it's it's easy to forget so yeah, at patch, what's the decorator? How do you use a decorator? So yeah, there you go. That's how you use a decorator. <coughs> okay. Okay, I'm patching request.get, all right? So let's run this. Okay, a test okay results takes one positional arguments, but two were given. Oh, looks like the decorator is actually injecting something. So this is we, what we call a mocked function. So this is mocked get. The get has been mocked here. So yeah, let's do it. Okay. Now remember that if we turn up the Wi-Fi, it gives a connection error, right? It doesn't come up to the result. It doesn't come up to the key error. We turned off the connection. So it's still trying to like do an HTTP request. So okay, we're gonna override, try to override this mock get dot return value. I think let's make it like mock get dot um, JSON because you see why we're putting in JSON here is because we're getting the data from the JSON method call. That's where we're returning on JSON dot JSON equals mock. Um, with a return value of, let me just steal whatever was here. So there we go. Oh, I, for, I turned off the internet. Come on. Let's hook up and yeah. Okay, turn it off again. Let's copy this and just, you know, keep this as a mock value. Okay, this should be the return value for the JSON. 
So let's try this again. Uh, yeah, where, where is it? PyTest. Okay, it's still. Okay, so let's just dive in and see where the problem is arising at. So the method is send. So it's the problem is that you are a lib. Okay, so my hunch tells me that we need to like patch request dot request here. Not get. Let's see. No, it's still the same thing. All right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what happens with mock is, uh, pardon me. So sometimes what happens is like you get these weird things going on around with like especially API calls, and sometimes there are a few libraries that are like specifically designed for mocking a single library. So uh, such a library for like this mock here is requests mock. It makes it much more easier to like do request mocking. So if you use this library here, it's gonna it's it has some of the cool features and whatnot. But <coughs> we can actually replicate the result with a regular patch right here. Um, all right, so let's just move on. Let's see, request mock without library. Let's see, how, how do we do that? How do we stop the side effect? I'm not sure if um, anyone has answered this on stock, Stack Overflow. So I might not create the drama I insisted on creating. So yeah. OK, so everyone's using that requests uh, mock library. So yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to use that then. Request mock, sure, why not? So pip install request mock. I think that's going to be much more easier to use than just a regular mock. All right, so got it. And using the mocker, OK. All right, so it's pretty straightforward. We just say with the mocker, do this. And uh, yeah, register the response. Cool. So our request is going to here. So let's not use this. Um, yeah. With requests. I hope uh, JetBrains already indexed it. Oh, it did. It sure did. Mock dot mocker. So I instantiate a mocker and m as the context, and I register m.get, now it, in this case it's going to be post to this, will return the value this. So this is the URL, and the return value should be a text. Oh, I can do text, OK. And the text is um, JSON dot dump s in this case since I didn't like make it a JSON all right cool so now if I call this here let's not get this mm-hmm pi test all right it passes so let's just turn off the internet to make sure that we're not making network calls and we're not cheating yep it passes so Let's just do something, right? Um, we forgot to do the assert. Let's do the assert. And it should assert to, let's say, Coca-Cola. The API shouldn't re return this, right? So let's do this. You're right, Coca-Cola. Now, we change the result that we're expecting right over here into Coca-Cola. So the the response that I'm mocking here to Coca-Cola. And we run the tests. Voila. All right, so that's why I didn't want to cover this, because it's a bit, mocking deserves its own talk. It deserves its own workshop. So just to give you an idea what we're doing here, this is a context right here. 
and we registered for this URL, if we post here, what should be the response? This method is using the requests library. That's why it's when it requests this URL, it gets exactly this response. So we can like take samples of how responses should, should work like and then test those cases like this. We don't have to like, uh, you know, uh, wait for the internet or something, uh, things like that. And we can actually like simulate status codes as well. You can give like status codes too uh, if you want to. So if you just look at the documentation, status code. So yeah, you can like get the status code and set the status code in the same way. This is like a very cool library. Um, there are some kind of specialized libraries for testing as well. So this request mock is one of those library specific testing libraries. So yeah, that was a mouthful. So this is something, the mocking is something that you won't, it's a bit counterintuitive in a way. And initially when you first see mocks, you won't get it. I mean, if you do get it, that's amazing, but there's a 99% chance you won't. The best way to understand what Mock's doing is to go home and like do a little playing around maybe with something, like a little project that does discrete writes. You try to like change the behavior, try to override this. You know, that's the way to go most probably, uh, I'd say. That's the best way to go. Right. The last part of today's talk is about um, refactoring your code. I think you will understand this very well, so that's fine. And they, we'll do ending of this uh, the workshop with how to measure how much code you covered, how much code you tested. So this is something your boss wants to see. Whenever you say, boss, I want to like refactor my code and like increase test coverage and like, okay, so give me a report. Like how do you put this as a number? How do you show this as a number? Because the boss needs to report to his boss, say, my, uh, this guy like, has 99% test coverage. So they need something to brag about, right? And you need, you need numbers. So we're going to check that later on. So let's just commit this and yeah, OK. Step eight. Now step eight is going to be really fun. Uh, there is no like, counterintuitive things like on mocking. So here you will see a new file pop up. If you check out cardme.py, now this is essentially the same thing we've been doing, but it's with Union Pay, Discover, and uh, interpayment cards. And the fun thing is, it's everything's together. You have input, you have print. How are you going to test this thing? You can't test it. You need to simulate. STD in and STD out. Do you, anyone wants to do that? Like one fun thing would be to like use another Python process, use it with like uh, sub process of p open. You write to the stream, you read from the stream, and then you check whether like the text is there. You could make a library for this. I mean, I don't know, um, but probably that's not the way to go. Um, you see, because input here again, it's the same problem. It's something that you are not controlling. It's something hard to control. Input. It's, it's just reads from the environment, reads from STDN. And print, it, you can't like directly see what's printed. You need to like my hook into STD out to see what's being printed. So we need to like decouple these things. We need to decouple the logic from the presentation to the user. So this decoupling is one of the refactorings that we need to do. So often, in mostly in web applications, like say in Flask or Django, our view code is written in a such a way that the application domain logic and uh, the presentation logic is all messed up together like a pile like this. You have requests coming in, you have responses going out, no way to check whether, explicitly check the application logic. So we are going to break this down and see how the breakdown process really works and what things we should consider while we're breaking down. So this is going to be an intense uh, few minutes. So I suggest that you like, uh, please follow through. And if you have any questions, please uh, 
let me know immediately. So our first assumption when we start to refactor is that the code is correct. This is our first assumption. It is correct. And we do not change the logic or anything while we're refactoring. So this is my way of working. In, the, in the, that case, it's much more easier to predict that I didn't like accidentally break something. So first, OK. What's the first thing that, like, how do we start the function? In number one, we're taking an input. I think that's a uh, great uh, problem. So first of all, let's just uh, ref refactor and rename this from main to get issuer. OK. First step done. And instead of taking an input from the stream, from the STDN, we make this an argument. A similar thing can be like when you're in Django, instead of taking the requests, uh, instead of taking the request object or instead of taking a form, you just pass a like literal value that's uh, the internal representation of your application. It's not like form or a or request. It basically, you see, the get issuer function doesn't need to care whether the input came from the web, from a mobile application, or from your CDN. It just cares about the number. So let it care only about the number. And the function should do just one thing. Let it do just one thing, right? OK, so now that we refactored it, so here is our new code. Um, we forgot to assign this here. All right. Now the number is being passed from here. We're getting the number from input, and we're passing the number here. So this function can now be a bit better now that we can f provide any value we want. We don't have to like do all sorts of std out voodoo or anything. Uh, we can just directly like put this in. All right. What's the second step? It's surprisingly pretty easy. Instead of printing out, or instead of doing like response.write in like for the web, we just return the value from here. Then we can just call the function and see if the values are OK. So let's do that. So first of all, I think we should write a few tests, right? Let's do test uh, card me. I don't know. Anything works. I'm just going to have one test for now, test union pay. And what this will do is we're going to call uh, get issuer. Of course, this time we'll import it from card me, not from card validator. Um, and uh, give a number. In this case, I think the number should be start with 81 and length is 16. So um, yeah, there we go, 81. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah, there we go. Cool. And now we should assert whether this equals, how did we write union pay? Like this. OK. All right. Let's see. Pi test. And one neat thing about PyTest is like you can say which exact file, test file you want to run. So you can, I can do PyTest v and tests and test card me. So it's gonna, just going to run the test from here. So our first problem is we got it. It's returning none from here null. And it's, we should expect a union pay card. But if you look at like, Oh, there's another problem here. The std out call, it's like this. So it's writing to std out. Here's the fun thing about like also PyTest. If anything's written to std out, it shows you. So it shows that you can like find out like where if you like messed something up. So it shows you right there, which is good. All right. So what we'll do is we will return Union pay card. OK. And 
Oh, still is an assertion error. That's weird. Hmm. I wonder what's wrong. Can you figure out what's wrong here? Shadow's name from outer scope. Oh, okay, okay. I, I think we just need to like get rid of this first, just to be sure. Mm -hmm. It's still like returning interpay card, so that's not a good thing at all. So let's see, eight one. It starts with eight one, and the length is. I think we messed up the length. That's probably the case. Uh, let's do this. Length of this check. Oh, 17. All right. Yep, sure. All right. Yep, now it passes. Great. Uh, now let's write a few cases for like naive tests again for like discover. So, and the length should be 16 to 19. So, I'm just going to copy this back here test discover discover card right all right now let's run the test again again we have the same problem we are writing to std out not to the function so cool let's uh, return so we know the routine by now so let's just fix this it should return this it should also return this okay there we go. Now that the tests are passing, we're just going to make sure that like actually the application is working how it was supposed to work. So I'm just going to run the uh, program here. Mm, let's just copy this number. Python, um, Python uh, cardme.py. Please enter the credit card number. Now we enter no. Sorry, unable to recognize card. Okay, it's, it's working. Now we enter this. Oh. Hmm, looks like we broke a functionality. It, it's like kind of doesn't work. Yeah, I think we forgot to print. We forgot to print the output. So let's take a response variable from here and print the response. Or, oh, come on. All right, union pick card. Yep, now it's uh, back working again. All right. I think one thing uh, that's we can change since we're returning, we can just turn this to ifs. And we can just by default turn back to this. That makes the code much more easier to read. And technically, we should be raising a value error here because we shouldn't be printing out. It should because errors, again, if we just go back to this, uh, if we go back to this again, right? What does it say? Error should never pass silently. So we should be as loud as possible when like dealing with errors. So we're going to have to raise a, a value error here. Raise value error. Um, unable to recognize card, maybe, yeah. So, yeah, and now also that what that means is we can also test for that. Previously, we couldn't test because it was writing to the console, but now we can test for it with assert raises, as we've seen before. We're not going to go through this, uh, but now that you have an idea of like what it means and how we should like refactor code for this, this is like a starter kit for that. Always keep like your domain logic and presentation separate. That way, this is your domain logic. It can be checked independently of like your framework, of your like application uh, layer or whatever. It's just totally separate, independently testable, regardless of how you're using it. You can just take this function and plug it into a Django application, plug it into a Flask application. No one cares. This is reusable code. And you can port this across like different frameworks and technologies. Of course, if it's Python, that is. Pardon me. So, any any confusions or anything I can cater to from this session? All right. Now with the fun part. 
how do we tell our bosses that we've been working really hard to like, you know, write tests? Like giving them the, them the numbers. Like, yeah, that's what we're talking about, right? I hope no managers are actually watching this because they'll know how the system can be cheated. So, yeah, I hope. All right. Ah, now we're at step nine. So basically what happened is like I don't have a step nine in the um, Git repo. So I'm doing a checkout B. So I'm creating a branch here. So if you just do a checkout, it, you'll get an error. So just to like beforehand, I'm letting you know. So this is quite easy at this point. So what you have to do is uh, go to your terminal or use the terminal there, that's fine. We need to install like two packages. We need to install uh, pip uh, install coverage and pytest cov. Oh, um, I forgot to turn on the internet because we were so busy mocking stuff. Um, we forgot to turn on the internet. And we should go well now. All right. So if you just run PyTest now, nothing's going to happen. But you'll see something interesting here. Uh, do you see these two things pop up, requests to mock and cov? So these are plugins to PyTest. And they register when you like install them or have them in the environment. So that's something useful to look out for. Uh, it's kind of a debug feature, so which is good. Cov. What I did is this is the command. Uh, let me just clear this up just to like so I can show you. Pytest. Uh, you don't have need the v. Okay, it's just for their verbus. But the actual thing is. Uh, we give the call flag and where to run the coverage. So coverage in respect to this directory. So run this. Um, you can configure it to ignore the test folder because everything is running there. That's fine. You can see like how much of the code has been covered, how many statements are there to total, and how many statements have not been run by the interpreter. There's a better way to get the HTML output. So let me, let me just grab some help. HTML, how do you get HTML? Oh, cov report, like this. So cov report, HTML. Mm, come on. Hmm. Okay, so coverage report written to dir html cov. So let's go back there. You'll see a folder pop up named html cov, and you can go to index and like open it through a web server or something, a browser, and you'll see like the details. And if you open up like issues, issuers, you can see which statements did not run during the test. Like, this wasn't tested for, I mean, for this uh, uh, test specifically. These have been tested. You can see the green, right? That means these lines were tested. And the red means these lines were not executed while the tests were running. That's how you know, for these cases, the tests are uncovered. Although, a fair bit of warning, don't take this too seriously. It's a good way to first figure out like what are the places that you missed. But sometimes it can be like, for example, look over here. It's just running a for loop. So it's just running the same instruction over and over again. There might be a use case that you didn't cover. It's like over here in, in this list or in this dictionary, but it won't get caught up because technically that line got executed. So a few things to remember here. Like don't get, get this, use this religiously. Um, if like uh, he, someone is telling you that like they have 100% test coverage, 
go to the tests, see the quality of the tests. I mean, you can just make sh all of these glow green with a, since you're a programmer, you can, but whether you want to now, that's uh, an ethical decision you need to make. So yeah. Use this as a tool to like help you, but not to like, you know, like completely don't trust it all the time. Like on card me, like you see, this is the practical example. This was never executed because again, it's under the if name main, so the main, as the main it didn't get executed. We tested these two cases, that's why they're green, but we didn't test for the interpayment card. That's why it's still um, red, and also we didn't test for the exceptions. So if we just go back and like check whether that's the case, um, yep, yeah, that's true. We just tested for the two cases, the others are missing. That's what the test is telling us. That's what this, the coverage um, test is telling us. So, yeah, that's pretty much it for today. Uh, wow, we finished um, 18 minutes before uh, the time. Oh my, so yeah, we finished it, we finished it. Uh, congr congratulations guys, thank you for attending. Thanks to everyone, we finished it. <laughs>